Welcome everybody. We're so excited to have everyone at our Sunday service. We're going to have an incredible service today. I know that many of us have been anticipating this moment, and this is a celebration because today is Palm Sunday. We're excited because this celebrates Holy Week. This is one week before Jesus went to the cross. The Bible says that he came into the city, and when he did, the people began to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. It was an expression of worship unto God, recognizing that salvation was here now, that healing was here now, that deliverance was here now. And I believe that in today's service, we're going to have a move of God that's going to touch you, and salvation is here now, healing is here now, and deliverance is here now. I want to open up with prayer, and then we're going to have a song and just worship the Lord for a moment. Then I have a special word for us today. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this moment. We're asking for your divine presence, Lord God, to begin to move, God. Begin to move from where I am and begin to touch everyone, Lord, that's logged on, everyone that's streaming, everyone that's watching. We're asking for a mighty move of your spirit, God. We're asking for a word to minister unto us. For we celebrate you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Go ahead and clap your hands right where you're at. And let's just love the Lord together. God, we love you and we worship you and we adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord in song now.
to God. Someone go ahead and worship Him. Go ahead and exalt His great name. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. Oh, it's a great day today. It's a great day because Jesus is King of Kings and He is Lord of Lords. It's a great day today because our promise is found in Him and the resurrection has already happened. Jesus has defeated the grave. Jesus has conquered death and disease. There is going to be a great conclusion, a conclusion of restoration. And we thank the Lord for that right now in Jesus' name. We're so grateful for everyone that's tuned in today, everyone that's ready to have some church. We've never done it this way before. It is different. We're separated in body, but we're not separated in spirit. And at this time, I want to draw your attention to a special word today. I really feel to bring a word of encouragement, a word that's going to provide some definitive direction in this season. And if you would get your Bibles with me right now and turn to two portions of Scripture. Romans chapter 3. I want to look at verse number 3 and 4 and then Job chapter 13. Verse number 15, please. Wonderful. Praise God. Romans chapter 3, verse number 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mayest, mightest be justified in thy saying, and thou mightest overcome when thou art judged. Let God be true and every man a liar. Go ahead and say that right now. Say it. Let God be true and every man a liar. Job chapter 13, verse number 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. I want to talk to us for a, a few moments on this subject. But he did not die. But he did not die. I'm going to have to have you track with me a little bit here. Track with me because... I've got to unpack this message, but it is going to highlight that very statement. But he did not die. Let's go before the Lord in prayer right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this great anointing, Lord God, that's already resting on me. I'm asking God that I can step back and you can step forward. I'm asking for clarity of thought and accuracy of speech. Let me minister unto the nations right now, God, by your word and through your power. In the name of Jesus, I declare all of you and none of me that the devil is defeated. And let signs and wonders confirm the ministering of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Go ahead, clap your hands unto the Lord right where you're at. Go ahead. Just take a moment and clap your hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. That's okay because we're having church here and we're having church there. And the same presence of God that's here is the same presence of God that is there. Faith joins us together that we can be one in the spirit. But he did not die. Today I'm going to be highlighting as uh, someone that we're going to draw from in scriptures is Job. We're going to look at Job's life. Job was one of the greatest characters in the Bible. The book of Job itself, it is the oldest book in the entire Bible. And that's very significant because this gives us a reference point that when God allowed the Bible to be written, when he allowed the Holy Writ to come together, and when he was wanting to give us that first book of the Bible, which would be the foundation of this book, 
He gives us the book of Job. That Job would represent something to us very significant. Job is recognized as a book that teaches us about trials and hardships. Situations that are beyond a person's control. It allows us to really look introspectively into a life of an individual that went through great trauma. And what we are facing today as a nation and what so many people have been disrupted and have been touched by this virus, I believe it is important today to look at Job. Look at Job's response. Because there was something precious that was in Job's life. There was something significant that was resting on Job. And that's the same thing that's resting upon us. There is an anointing that's resting upon the church. There is an anointing that's resting upon the believer. An anointing to prevail. An anointing to push forward. And when we look at Job, we, we look at a situation that was very abstract to Job. A situation that Job could not ever have considered would ever take place. For you see, you have to understand that Job was the greatest man in all of his land. The Bible says in uh, Job chapter 1, in verse number 3, the latter part, he was the greatest of all the men of the East. Job was the greatest of all the men in the East. Job had uh, great prestige. Job had great position. Job had great possessions. And Job had great power. He had prestige, position, possession, and he had power. In other words, all of the region recognized Job. Job had the attention of everyone. And so God was going to allow it because everyone knew who Job was and because the spotlight was on Job's life. God was going to allow something to come to Job that was going to touch the entire region. Not only was it going to touch the entire region and the ages of the past, it's going to touch us today. It's going to touch us today with some fresh oil, some fresh anointing, some fresh encouragement. Because I'm here to tell us today, let God be true and every man be a liar. We're not going to believe the report of the devil. We're not going to allow man to determine the final conclusion. We're going to allow the word of God to speak to us. We're going to allow God to be true. And that means that what has been, re has been loosed and what has been released is going to conclude how God has determined for it to be. And so as we look at Job's life, in Job chapter number one there, and I want you to go there. I want you to look with me at verse number one. We're going to begin to read through Job's life for a few moments here. So there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Now the word Job, his name for, literally means one that is hated. One that is hated. Why is that? Because of Job's possessions, because of his positions. Because of the power that he had, the influence that he had with God, because he chose to walk with God in a day that was very dark. Many people hated Job, and they really didn't think that if Job would lose his possessions, if he would lose his position, they didn't think that he would walk with God, and God was going to allow Job to be a living allegory. Let's look at his life here. A man from the land of Uz, whose name was Job, that a man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and his Jude, or he hated evil. Look at his characteristics. This was a perfect man. That means he was a complete man. He was a man that was balanced. He was a man that was developed in his relationship with God. He was developed in his relationship with his family, his children. He was developed in his business. The Bible says he was an upright man. He was a man of great integrity, one that feared God. That means he was a man that considered God in every decision that he made. To fear God is to honor God or to reverence God. And this was Job. It says that he hated evil. In other words, he was mindful of his decisions. He was mindful of his actions, that he would not offend God. 
He wanted to make sure that his family was living for God and standing for God. The Bible says that he had seven sons, verse number two, and there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And his sons went and they feast in their house every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the day of their feasting was gone about that Job sent and he sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continuously. Job made sure that he was offering up sacrifice for his children. Now you have to understand that this was in the Old Testament and where they would sacrifice animals, lambs if you would, and, then, and the sacrifice, the blood, would cover the sins of the people for a period of time. I'm glad we're in the New Testament today that the great lamb, Jesus Christ, that his blood has been shed and that we don't have to sacrifice animals, but we can turn to the one that has been sacrificed. But Job sacrificed. He did this for his children. He was praying for them. He had a covering over his children through his relationship with God. There was a covering over him. There was a covering over everything that he had. And though the devil would go to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking about whom he may devour, Job couldn't touch. Rather, Satan couldn't touch Job. And so one day, God was going to allow Job to come to the attention of Satan. The Bible says in verse number six, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also with them. The sons of God are the angels. They're coming before the presence of the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? He's a perfect man, an upright man. He's one that fears God. He wants, he's one that hated evil. Now I want you to notice that God brought the attention of Job before Satan. It was not Satan that brought his attention to Job. God did that. And the reason why I want you to look at that, because God is, was in control of Job's life. God was the one that was going to allow this trial to hit Job's life. This trial that was unconscionable. This, top, this trial that was going to be uh, deeply ambiguous to Job and to his family and to his friends. But I want you to know that if God allowed something to touch your life, if God allowed something to touch our nation, it's because God has a greater meaning and a greater purpose. And sometimes when something begins, we can't see it and we don't understand it. But we've got to trust the same God that called the attention to Satan in regards to Job is the same God that's caused our nation and even our world before Satan to, to loose this plague and loose this virus that's disrupted everyone's life. He goes on and said, Has thou not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the works of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. I want you to notice that God blessed the hands of Job because Job chose that he was going to be a servant of God. God says, have you looked at my servant, Job? There's none like him in all the earth. God describes him as, as a servant because, you see, it wasn't the possessions that made Job who he was. It wasn't his position that made him and who he was. It wasn't all the influence or the power that he possessed. It's that Job declared, I am a servant unto God. And because he was a servant unto God, there are rewards for being a servant unto God. There are rewards for lifting up righteousness and walking 
and truth. And this was Job. He did this. There was a hedge over him. It is God's ultimate plan that his blessing would rest upon us and his hands would be over us. And I don't want you to think that God's not going to restore that unto you and that God's not going to make you better than what you once were. He is going to do that. He has simply brought the attention of Satan to you because God's got an ultimate plan. God's causing all of us to go deeper because he knows just how Job was accused that if you would remove everything, you remove the, the assets, if you remove the hedge off of him, he says he will curse you to your face. And that's exactly the accusation of Satan today, the devil, the enemy of our soul. He's making an accusation. Lift off the hedge of this nation and they'll turn on you. Lift off this hedge on the church and they'll turn on you. They'll walk away from you, but he doesn't understand the power that's in the church. He doesn't understand the relationship that we have with God and our commitment with him. That you can strip away the assets and you can strip away the material things. And you can strip away all of the different things that someone would say that we are blessed. Because we are the servants of Almighty God. Because we live for Him. Because we're blood bought. And we are filled with the Spirit. We are not connected to Him because of what He does for us. We're connected to Him for what He's done in us. I'm going to say that again. This is not about what the Lord has done for us, but rather what he has done in us. Whatever we lose, we'll get that back. But what he is doing inside of us right now, he's causing us to go deeper. He's causing us to go further. And this is what he did to Job. Job's life begins to unfold. And we're going to see that there's four accounts of a, of a vicious trial that he had to endure. I mean, it was intrusive. Look at Job chapter 1, verse number 13 through 22. I want you to look at it with me in the Amplified, if you will. And there was a day when Job's sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house on his birthday. There was a birthday party. The family was coming together. They were celebrating the birthday party. Verse number 14 is going to refer to one of the enemies that once looked at Job and knew that the hedge was on Job, that Job was blessed. One of, his, one of these people that envied him was going to make an attempt to raise some of Job's assets. And verse number 14 says, And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkey feeding beside them. And the Sabines swooped down upon them and took away the animals. And indeed, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone escaped to tell you. Job, I've got some bad news for you. That while your oxen, your cattle were together, while your mules and, and some of your assets were together, and your servants were watching over them, the Sabines came. They overthrew them. They killed all your servants, Job. They stole your mule. They, they stole uh, some of your cattle, Job. I'm the only one that was able to escape. Seems like a hardship. That was only the beginning of Job's problems here. It touched his life by taking some of his personal assets. It was touching his business. His cattle represented his agricultural business that he had. So it began to touch that. And while that was going on, verse 16 says, and while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God's lightning has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped. He said, Job, Lightning came from the sky, and when the lightning came from the sky, it, it hit the sheep. It consumed the sheep. It consumed all of the servants. I'm the only one that's escaped. Only one, just enough to bring the negative report. That's how the enemy works. Tries to disrupt your life, tries to touch your life, and make sure that there's someone there that's going to bring the negative report. 
So Job had to hear, I, I lost my cattle, I lost my mules, my servants are dead. Only one got to escape. And then it goes on and it says here, lightning fell from the sky and consumed all of his sheep. When the servant tells him, the servant interprets it, he said, lightning that's come from God. But ladies and gentlemen, the lightning didn't come from God. The lightning came from the devil. They assumed because of the bad that was happening to Job that Job somehow, he warranted the bad, but Job didn't warrant this bad. Thank God Job had a revelation of who God was. Job had a revelation of the goodness of God and the greatness of God. And he wasn't going to deter from his attitude with God. Verse number 17 says, While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans divided into three bands and made a raid upon the camels and have taken them away, and yes, and have slain the servant with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell thee. The Chaldeans, another distant people, came and they, and they raided Job's assets. They took his camel. Job's entire business was being dismantled. His servants that worked for him were all being slain. Job lost his business. Job's economy was disrupted. I know that there's some of you watching today. Your economy is being disrupted. I want you to know that just like Job, God has a plan for you. And it's important that you keep your trust in God and what he is going to do. Don't allow yourself to be diverted. Don't allow your faith to be wounded or defeated. You may feel a sense of discouragement, but keep your faith in God. Continue to trust Him. Continue to believe in the outcome of how all of this is going to conclude. If that wasn't worse or bad enough, the final thing that happened to Job, verse number 18, and while yet speaking, there came also another and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine your elder brother's house, your oldest son's house, behold, there came a great whirlwind from the desert and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people and they are dead. A wind came and hit the house and when it hit the house, it moved the structure. When it moved the structure, the roof collapsed. Job, your seven sons were inside there. Your three daughters were inside there. All of them be, have become a victim to the storm. They have all died. They are all dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse 20, then Job arose. He rent his clothes. He shaved his head. He fell down upon the ground. And watch this. He began to worship. Was Job grieving? Did he feel it? Yes, he felt it. Yes, we're feeling this as a nation. We're feeling this as a church. We can't come together and worship how we normally would worship. We can't fellowship with one another how we would normally fellowship. Some of us are quarantined and we can't touch our children and we can't touch our families and we haven't been outside and we're hearing all of this negative news just like Job. All of his possessions were stripped from him. All of his prestige was stripped from him. His children alone, they, they were slain. All of them were slain. He, he, he ripped his clothes off of him. He put sackcloth on. He shaved his head. In other words, Job was grieving. And you know what he did? He raised his hands unto the Lord. And he began to worship the Lord. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to raise your hands unto the Lord. And I want you to worship him. In the midst of the pain, I want you to worship him. In the midst of the struggle, I want you to worship him. In the midst of whatever it is you are facing, I want you to worship him. Because when you begin to worship him, worship puts you in God's presence. In other words, Job was saying, you may have stripped me of my prestige. You may have stripped me of my position. You may have stripped me of all my possession. But I'm not going to let you strip me of God's presence. I'm going to worship him. And I'm going to hold on to God's presence. I'm going to stand on the name of the Lord. And I'm not going to be moved. Go ahead and worship him right where you are at. God, we worship you. God, we worship you. God, we worship you. You are worthy to 
should be worshipped. Now watch this. Because he began to worship him, and because he drew into God's presence, it began to encourage Job. Watch his outlook, verse 21. And said, Naked without possessions came I into this world from my mother's womb, and naked and without possessions shall I depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed, praised, and magnify and worship be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. And all that he went through, he didn't charge God foolishly. Why? Because he had a revelation. He had a revelation. It was God that has given me everything. It is God that has blessed me. I came into this world naked and naked I'm going to depart. But I'm going to use my mouth because I'm worshiping him. My worship aligns my attitude that I can bless the name of the Lord. And what was Job doing? Job was being a witness in that time. Job was being a witness to his community. He was being a witness to all of his neighbors. He was being a witness to all of his haters. Everyone around him could not point a finger at Job and say that Job was superficial or Job was shallow. No, they had to look and say that Job was walking with God. God had a witness on the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, through all hardships, God is going to have a witness in the earth. God's going to have somebody that has a testimony. The Bible says that we declare that we love not our lives unto death, but rather that we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The word of our testimony of what the blood of the Lamb has done for us. Don't forget what the Lord has done for you. Don't forget in the midst of whatever suffering you're going through. Don't forget he's given you salvation. And your salvation is greater than the suffering. And your salvation is greater than the moment. You're going to rise above this. You're going to go through this. And you're going to shine brighter than you have ever shined before. If that wasn't enough of all of what Job lost. Lost his sheep. Lost his camels, lost his oxen, lost his possessions, lost his children. Now again, God is going to present Job to Satan one more time. And when he presents Job to Satan one more time, it is recognizing and highlighting that there is none like Job in all of the earth. And once again, Satan's going to come. He's going to accuse Job. Let's look at it. Job chapter 2, please. Job chapter 2, beginning at verse number 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also amongst them, presenting himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence cometh thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Job says, the Lord says, where have you been? What you been doing? He says, I've been moving throughout this domain. I've been moving all around this globe. I'm walking through this globe. Why was he walking through the globe? Because he was looking for a place where he can touch. Because anytime Satan touches anything, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He was wanting to disrupt and affect the earth. He already... Uh, touched Job's life but already in a very personal way and now God's presenting Job to, to Satan once again watch what he says in verse number 3 and the Lord said unto Satan hast thou considered my servant Job now wait a minute God it was already fiery for Job Job has already lost enough he's lost all of his assets he's lost all of his all of the, everything that gave him the prestige, the position, the asset. His children. He lost his children. He's grieving. God, why would you present Job? Because there's more to Job. And there's more in Job. And Job is going to be an example that's going to reach over 4,000 years later. His life is going to be an illustration for so many whose lives would be touched 
with trials, whose life would be touched, touched with troubles. Job's going to be a reference point to understand that you can make it when you, as you face the valley of the shadow of death, you can continue to move forward because I'm with you in the midst of the valley. He says, have you considered Job? There's no like him in the earth. He's a perfect man, an upright man. He's one that fears God and he's true or he hated evil. And still he holds fast his integrity. Although thou move me against him to destroy him without a cause. God said, you pointed your finger when I told you how exceptional he was, that he was upright. Because he was doing something right. Because he was walking in righteousness, he was brought before you. See, this isn't happening to you, and disrupting your life for what you've done wrong. This is disrupting your life for what you've done right. See, we can understand that if our lives are disrupted and, and touched with evil or with hardship, if we've done something wrong, but when you haven't done anything wrong and all you've been trying to do is live for God and believe and push forward, how could this disrupt my life? It is because this is a season where God is saying, I'm going to have your faith be purified. I'm going to have your faith be purified because I'm going to have you rise higher and to go deeper into a greater dimension with me. God's saying, I'm giving you access to, to more, but the way you're going to get access to more, the, you're going to have to give up more. You're going to have to give more up of yourself if you're going to get more access to me is what God is saying. And God's teaching us this example through Job. Verse number four, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man has will he give for his life. Skin for skin, God. All right, I took away his stuff. I took away his children, but you let me touch him. You let me afflict his body. You allow disease to hit his body and he'll curse you to your face, God. You think that he's got integrity of heart? You think that he's going to stand for you? You let him be afflicted in his body. Oh, yes, and this is what he is saying right now. He's saying, you let me touch the church. You let me afflict the church. You allow them to contract the virus because they've been given the promise and the declaration that they are covered and they are under the shadows of the Almighty. But you allow one of them to get a fever. You allow one of them to, to, to break out with a sense of discomfort. And they'll curse you to your face is what he is saying. And God is saying, oh, you don't know my church. You don't know my people that's in the earth. You don't know how they stand on this earth with the blood of Jesus. You don't know how I've empowered them on the inside with my Holy Spirit that it is fused. That they're not going to attend to themselves, but they're going to attend to my words. They're not going to look for themselves, but they're going to look to exalt my name and to, and to be a witness into the earth. That's exactly what's happening right now. Verse 5. But put forth thy hand now and touch his bones and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hands, but save his life. He is in thy hands, but save his life. You can do whatever you want to do to him, but you can't kill him. Ah, that's what I want us to get this afternoon. That's what I want us to, to embrace today. I want you to capture this revelation today. Because what's going to happen next, Job's body is getting ready to break out with boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. He was going to break out with so many boils that he was going to, he was going to appear disfigured and, and out of a normal appearance. It was going to be so bad that his own wife was going to look at him. Job, what are you even doing keeping your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die, Job? Because everyone thought Job was going to die because it looked like he was going to die. But Job was not going to die, and you're not going to die. The church is not going to die, nor is our nation going to die. It may look bad, but it ain't going to conclude bad. You may have thought, oh, everyone 
everyone's being affected and everyone's being disrupted and, and oh, am I ever going to prevail? And, and, and there's kind of a spirit that's moving through the land that, are, that people are thinking they're going to die. I'm here to tell you, you're not going to die. Job did not die. He was so disfigured. He was so affected by the situation. And it was so bad because it was, it was so invasive in his life. But it can only go so far. I want you to know that while it appears that the devil is having his way in this moment, while it appears that evil is prevailing, it can only go so far. It's touched your life. It's affected you. It looks like you're going to die. It feels like you're going to die, but you are not going to die because he did not die. He could not die. His destiny was greater than his affliction. And church, your destiny is greater than this affliction. Nation, this, our destiny is greater than this affliction. What we're facing as a nation cannot compare to what the Lord is going to do after it. We've just got to get through it. And we can hold on in this moment and we can stand on our foundation because we can know I'm not going to die. Because Job did not die. So would say amen to that right there. The Bible says that Job's friend came. Verse number 10, but he said unto his wife, thou speaketh as a foolish woman, thou speaketh what Shall we receive good at the hands of God? And shall we not receive the evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. And all of it. He said, wait a minute. God is the one that's blessed us. He says, even if God touches me with evil, who am I to point my finger at God? Who am I to speak foolishly against God? In other words, Job understood that he didn't merit God's goodness in the first place. God gave him his goodness. He wasn't entitled to his goodness. See, that's why his heart was upright. He wasn't an arrogant man. He wasn't a pretentious man. Job's friends come. And I want you to see verse number 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came, every one, from his own place. Elf, Lyphaz, Terminite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Manthathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, they came to mourn with Job. To comfort Job. I want you to see what happens. Verse number 12. When they lifted up their eyes afar off. And knew him not. They lifted up their voice. And they wept. And they rent every one his mantle. And sprinkled dust upon their heads towards the heaven. They sat down with him. Upon the ground. Seven days and seven nights. And spake none. Spake not a word. Unto him. For they saw that his grief was very great. While they were coming to Job, and while they were approaching his home and they saw him, they didn't recognize that it was him. They didn't recognize because of the boil. They didn't recognize because of the affliction. They didn't recognize because of the deep sorrow. See, Job was going through a metamorphosis. He was going through a transformation. And we're going through a transformation right now. And when you go through a transformation, you can't judge it midway. You can't judge what happens uh, to a caterpillar when it goes through that process. That met metamorphio in the Greek, that transformative process that a butterfly has to go through. It goes through that caterpillar state. And then it goes into that cocoon state. And while it's there, it looks like it's dying. It looks like it's not going to recover. And you would never realize that something that appears to be so ugly is 
going to be transformed into something so beautiful. You see, the butterfly is transformed through that state and through that process where it, it sheds off the cocoon. It loses something that it doesn't really need. That it can be something greater than what it was. That's exactly what God's doing right now. I know you feel like you're going to die, but you're not going to die because Job didn't die. Job had to go through this transformation. He had to go through this process. He was shedding something off. In Psalms 118, I want it to be a word of encouragement to you. I want to highlight verse number 17, but looking at verse number 16. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord, that's Jesus. Jesus is the right hand of the Lord. He says, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Why don't you say that right where you're at right now? Say, I shall not die, but I shall live. And I shall declare the wonderful works of the Lord to every person in the hospital. I declare you shall not die, but you shall live and declare the wonderful works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he has not given me over unto death. The Lord has chastened me. The Lord has allowed this affliction to come upon me, but this is not going to be unto my death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. Open unto me the gates of righteousness. He says, I'm going to go into them. He said, then I'm going to praise the Lord. How do you open up the gates of righteousness? Through thanksgiving. Through thanksgiving, you continue to give God thankfulness in the moment that you are in through your worship. You say, God, I worship you in the midst of my hardships. God, I worship you in the midst of my heartache. God, I worship you in the midst of what I'm going through. And as you are worshiping him, I'm telling you what, the gates are opening up and you're going to go into a deeper dimension in the Lord with your praise. You're going to praise God like you've never praised God before. It's going to be deeper than a shout. There will be something that's going to be more meaningful on the inside after this is all done. Life is going to be more meaningful when this is all done. Church is going to be more meaningful when this is all done. Oh, I see the revival in what God is doing. God's allowing a metamorphosis to take place inside of everyone. God's touching our nation like he's never touched our nation. He's touching our world like he's never touched our world. The church needs to continue to praise God, declare that we shall not die but live, and declare the wonderful works of the Lord. He said, this gate of the Lord into which righteousness shall enter, I will praise thee. For thou hast heard me, and you are become my salvation. He says, I'm going to praise thee. See, praise identifies God. And when you begin to identify God, God becomes a thing that you identify in that moment of your life. I'm going to say that again. Praise identifies God. When you begin to praise him and you begin to say, God, you're still good in the midst of my hardships. Your praise identifies God's goodness and it brings God's goodness. God, you're still a healer in the midst of sickness. Your praise identifies him as a healer and then healing comes and healing begins to touch you. He said, I'm going to praise you for thou hast heard me. And I'll become my salvation. You see, you have salvation, but he's going to become your salvation. <laughs> he's going to be something more to you than he has ever been to you before. Because this is costing us something. See, Job said in 13, Job 13, verse number 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I believe that there is a witness today that even, Lord, if you slay me, yet will I trust you because I have revelation of you because I'm filled with your spirit. And that's the testimony that I've been hearing from so many, some that have contracted a fever, some that have been ill. They've had the attitude that though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain my own way before him. 
Satan, you can't touch this. You may touch the outside. You may disrupt our lives in some type of way. We may be uncomfortable. We may not prefer what we are in right now, but you can't touch us because we are joint with Christ and we are one with God. And there's nothing that's going to stop us in this moment. We may have felt like we're going to die. It may look like we were going to die, but we are not going to die. We're going to live and declare the wonderful works of God. Someone go ahead and praise him right there. Come on, go ahead and praise him right there. What is it that the Lord could be doing in this moment? What is it that he could be allowing us to go through this disruption, this trial, this fiery situation in our lives? It's found in Job 23. Look with me at Job 23. Look at verse number 8 through 12. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backwards, but I cannot perceive him on the left hand. Where he does work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I can't see him. Job says, I look to my right. God, you're not there. I look to my left. God, you ain't, God, I look before me, you ain't there. God, I turn around. God, I can't see you, God. But yet Job is still standing. Why are you standing, Job? Because I can't see him, but I know that he can see me. I may not feel like I can touch him, but I know that he is still touching me. He says in verse number 10, but he knows the way that I take. Oh, I know that God knows the way that I take. God knows the way that you take. God knows that you're going to stand on his name. God knows that you're going to continue to believe. God knows that you're going to continue to press. God knows that you're going to continue to be a witness. You will be a witness in an innovative way. You're going to have to do things you've never done before. But you're going to let your light shine. You're going to allow the world to know that your heavenly father is alive. He knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That when he tries me, I'm going to come forth as gold. Job got the revelation of why the Lord has allowed his life to be tried and tested. He, he got the revelation of why the Lord has allowed him to go through the fiery trial. Because it's only through the fiery trial that the gold that's inside of us comes up. Sometimes too much comfort. Sometimes too much complacency. Sometimes we, we live our lives and we digress. We allow our lives to be cluttered with things. When we don't give God our best. And God says, I'm not going to allow them to go through this trial. It's going to be a fiery trial. But if they go through this fiery trial, I'm going to be able to remove the dross. I'm going to be able to remove the impurity. I'm going to allow the gold to come up. I'm going to allow the power of my spirit to begin to flow through them. And they're going to begin to touch other people like they never touched them before. They're going to begin to believe like they never believed before. They're shedding off things that they once thought that they needed. Things that I've asked them to say, get rid of that. And disregard that. And get more focus in my word. And see, now you've got the time to get focus in my word. He's, he's told you, build your family. Get, establish your family. And now you're confined to your home. Now you can do that. You can build your home. You can build your family. You can invest the word in your family. Now, all these material things seem so meaningless. Now that life has brought before you life and death, the disruption, the rattling, the appearance of so many perceiving, not going to make it. And yet now, we look through a glass darkly, but when it's over, it's going to be face to face. It's going to be the fiery trial that's purged us and purified us. Listen to what Peter says. And I'm going to be closing here. I'm going to be closing here. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. 
He said, think it not strange. The fiery trial that's, that, that has happened unto you. He said, don't think that it's strange. In other words, we should expect that times there will be season. And that's what this is. This is a season. A season when we are being purged. Season when we are being purified. He said in verse number 13, but rejoice in as much as you are the partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. When his glory shall be revealed. Don't think it strange of the fiery trial as some type of strange thing, because his glory is going to be revealed in you. And that's what's happening. The glory of God is being revealed in you in such a greater way. Your witness, your stand, and your strength. You're not going to die. Your family member is not going to die. You shall declare the wonderful works of the Lord and live. For the Bible says, the end of Job's life. Job chapter 42, go there real quick. This is the end of Job's life. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Ah, God blessed the latter end of Job's life better than the beginning. The same God that blessed you the first time, God's going to bless you in the latter end. When this is all done, God's going to restore things unto you, and he's going to restore them better than what they were. Listen to what it said. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and a thousand yokes of ox, oxen, and a thousand she mules. And he had also seven sons and three daughters. So you see, God restored Job double. It looked like he was going to die. It felt like he was going to die. But Job's witness and Job's reach was expanded double. And your witness and your reach for the kingdom of God it's going to expand to double. The church is going to expand. Oh, I'm telling you more than double. The church is going to expand. People are reaching to Jesus. People are hearing this message. They're discovering hope. Oh, I can't wait for us to come together because the waters of baptism will be stirred once again. And so many names are going to go down in the name of Jesus. So many people are going to be filled with the Spirit. And if you're watching me right now, and you've been having a hard time, I want to pray for you. If you're watching right now, maybe you don't know Jesus. I'm here to tell you that he wants to reveal himself to you. And he wants to touch you in a very special way. Let me pray for you. Close your eyes right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive your word right now. We're not going to die but live. Job did not die and we're not going to die. I'm asking God right now for every person viewing and watching, every person that's had a heavy heart, every person that's been dealing with anxiety, every person, Lord God, whose lives have been touched, I'm asking God right now for the anointing of this message to touch them in the name of Jesus. Receive the touch of the Spirit right now. Receive strength right now. You shall not die but live and declare the wonderful works of God. And I pray right now for you that don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, begin the process right now. I just want you to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and surrender your life over to him. This begins the process. I promise you he'll meet you right where you are at. That as you hear me right now, that same anointing that's here is moving through the airwaves, reaching you right now. And if you would just receive that word, let's start the process. Close your eyes. Just close your eyes and open up your heart right now. Just begin to say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Lord Jesus, I ask for you to forgive me of all of my sins. Lord, I've been far from you a long time. And now I realize what really matters. And so I'm committing my heart to you. I'm turning from this world. I'm turning from an old life of sin. 
I'm turning to you, Lord. And I'm committing myself. In the name of Jesus, I surrender my life over to you, God. Lord, I will complete out the rest of the steps that's required of me. But in the name of Jesus, I give you my life in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I want to encourage you. Mark your calendar because very soon we're going to be able to come together. We're going to be able to assemble together and worship. And all those that have been watching and all those that maybe you've never been able to come, you've been looking for a church, a place where you can plant yourself, a place where you can be strengthened. I want you to know that as you view us today, you can join our online campus and be a part of our church. And when we open up, you can begin to come and worship God with us. I promise you there is a warm seat waiting for you here at Christian Revival Center. In conclusion, I'm going to remind every person, every member, every person that's a part of the body, and maybe even you just viewing at large, this is offering time. I want to conclude by encouraging you today to give a sacrificial offering, an offering, yes, that's going to help us in ministry, but an offering that honors the Passover, for you see the Passover begins next week, Easter Sunday. And I want you to give the best offering to support that. And if you would like to sow your tithings in as well, you can do that by going to our website. You can go to christianrevivalcenter.org and there's a giving tab that's there. And that will open up and take you through the necessary process. It's very safe. It's the easiest way to give. It's to give electronically. If you would like to, to mail it, you can mail it to Christian Revival Center, 805 West 57th Avenue, Maryville, Indiana, 46410. I'm so grateful that you tuned in today. It's been my honor to minister the word of the Lord to you. I want you to know we love you, and God bless.